I'm going to talk today about decolonization. Decolonization was the process that occurred after the Second World War, which created the political contours of the world as we know it today. For the rest of this course, essentially since the Second World War, we're no longer going to talk about Europe much. More and more, the trends, the political, the cultural, the economic, the demographic trends that we'll discuss are global trends. They affect the world. They, they have impact on a global scale and link together different places um, without going through Europe. Um, this is a moment, decolonization is the culmination of the collapse of European and Western domination. Um, and control of these global dynamics. Decolonization results in the creation of sovereign states. So in 1900, there were 55 sovereign states and 13 empires. You can see this on this map here. This is the contours of the colonial world uh, after the First World War. You can see there are relatively few powers which occupy a great deal of territory. Today, however, there are 193 sovereign states. This all happened during the few decades following the Second World War in the process of decolonization. Alongside this, the preponderance of populations of European descent uh, collapsed. So in 1900, Europeans and people of European descent represented about one-third of the global population. Today, people of European descent represent less than one-sixth of the global population. And you can see in this map of population density, uh, the greatest population densities are in East and Southeast Asia, not in Europe. So this is a process of decentering. It's a process of decentering and the process of the creation of sovereign states. Uh, although it doesn't completely eliminate the concentration of financial power and political power in, among peoples of European descent and among European states. How did this happen? Well, this is a direct consequence of the Second World War. The Second World War drained the will and the resources of European powers to fight to maintain their colonies. In addition, during both world wars, the first and second, European powers had promised their colonies independence, autonomy, in exchange for providing supplies and people, men, to fight in the army. And on both of those occasions, European powers, after the end of the war, reneged on their promises um, and wish to go back to business as usual. Although they largely succeeded after the First World War, after the Second World War, colonies had had enough. They had seen that non-Europeans could defeat Europeans in battle. They saw how the Japanese had displaced Europeans from the Southeast Asian colonies. Um, and European col colonization no longer seemed um, uh, inevitable. Second, uh, many colonial subjects had, had, been, had grown up in a world that was increasingly urban. Um, they had been educated by colonial schools, often had traveled um, to the metropole to receive advanced education, as here Mohandas K. Gandhi, the leader of the independ Indian independence movement, um, had been educated as a lawyer. Um, so you had a, a, a group of highly educated colonial elites. Um, who then went on to lead anti-colonial movements. I want to talk about two very, imp very important distinction between two types of colonies. Settler colonies on the one hand, in which many Europeans had settled, had established um, families, farms, businesses, um, and on the other hand, non-settler colonies. These colonies uh, these are colonies whose function was mainly to funnel raw materials uh, into the metropole, but not large numbers of Europeans had not settled there. This distinction had enormous importance when it came to the nature of decolonization. I want to start with non-settler colonies, and I'll use India as the example. 
although there were several others, the Philippines, uh, the American colony in the Philippines, the West Indies, um, West Africa, uh, all of these colonies were able to achieve independence in a relatively nonviolent way. Colonized peoples used the ta techniques and the tactics of mass politics, demonstrations, strikes, boycotts. They mobilized international public opinion against the colonizers, against the European colonial powers, in order to put pressure on the Europeans to withdraw. Uh, for example, in India, which had been a, a British colony um, since roughly the end of the 18th century, however, was not a major settler colony. Large numbers of Britons had not moved there. It, had not, it was not seen as an extension of the territory of Britain um, in terms of settlement, although it was an extremely important economic resource for Britain um, in supplying raw materials for British industry. Um, so in this context, where there was not a massive settler population, uh, leaders of the Indian independence movement, in particular Mohandas K. Gandhi, um, advocated the use of persuasion and nonviolence as a tactic in their anti-imperial struggle. Gandhi, as I mentioned, was educated as a lawyer in South Africa. He was committed to independence as a political struggle not a violent or a military struggle. And it turned out that the context of colonization in India supported this tactic in that the British were not ready to employ uh, large numbers of military forces or violent tactics in order to defend their possession. Uh, following the First World War, Gandhi and the Indian National Congress committed themselves to what they called Swaraj, political uh, and cultural, spiritual, independence. They established a movement called the Satyagraha movement, which urged the use of Indian instead of British products. You'll remember that one key, key feature of the new imperialism was that the colonies were discouraged or actively prohibited from developing their own industry. They were captive markets for colonial, for goods from the metropole. So Gandhi and the Indian, Indian National Congress uh, sought to foster uh, an autonomous economy using Indian produced goods, um, such as textiles here and cotton. Uh, they also refused to participate in British colonial institutions. They refused to pay taxes. They refused um, uh, to appear in schools, British schools, British law courts. They essentially refused to, to legitimize the British colonial structure. Satyagraha, as Gandhi and others formulated it, relied on three basic tenets. Uh, satya, or truth, implying openness, honesty and fairness, nonviolence, ahimsa, physical and mental nonviolence, and finally, tapasya, or self-sacrifice. Uh, and the nationalist cause was integrated into uh, the interests and industries that formed the economy of the common Indian population. So farming, cloth production, um, salt, uh, very basic goods uh, that many, many Indians were attached to. Gandhi decided to make the salt tax. This was a tax that Britons uh, charged on every purchase of salt, which had an enormous impact on very poor Indians. Gandhi decided to make that the focus of the anti-colonial movement and of nonviolent political protest. He led a, so, uh, a salt march, um, which which marched to the seashore and held a rally um, at which Gandhi raised a lump of mud and salt um, and declared, with this I am shaking the foundations of the British Empire. He was refusing to pay the tax on salt. The effects of this march were felt throughout India and throughout the British Empire, the larger world. Similar sim civil disobedience uh, movements erupted throughout the nation and in other non-settler colonies. The movement converted many Indians to the nationalist cause, 
and ultimately succeeded in obtaining uh, the independence of India in 1947. What it did not succeed, though, was in preventing secular violence between Hindus and Muslims. This was the basis of the partition of the British Indian Empire into what we now know as India, Pakistan to the, to the west, and what became Bangladesh uh, to the east. This was a violent process. The British handled it very badly. They let some 550 prince, principalities decide um, which side that they would go to, uh, which side they would join, a Hindu India or a Muslim Pakistan, um, which resulted in great violence, and this is a disturbing image, um, great secular violence uh, between Hindus and Muslims, and the displacement of some seven million people um, from one side to the other. Muslims moving from what had become the Indian territory into Pakistan and vice versa, and some 500,000 to a million deaths. Uh, so this was not a purely peaceful process, but the departure of the British was achieved without military violence. And that's the key point. In non-settler colonies, uh, independence was achieved using the techniques of mass politics. I want to contrast this now with settler colonies. And I'll take Algeria as my case study. In the settler colonies, that, that is colonies where large numbers of Europeans had made their home um, and felt that this was their home, uh, European powers resisted independence movements violently with military force. Uh, these are countries like Ke uh, French Algeria. British Kenya, or French Indonesia, which then, uh, or Indochina, uh, which became Vietnam. Here we see the development of counterinsurgency techniques, in which every resident of the colonial state, the colonial territory, is considered a potential insurgent. Um, and violence is applied to an entire population in order to suppress independence movements. Some of the counterinsurgency techniques that are still used today were developed in colonial wars, such as Algeria. That is, the resettlement of large populations, psychological operations, and torture in order to figure out who, is, who in fact, is a member of a liberation movement and who is not. Um, we see tactics in which fighters blended in with the regular population, and colonial powers couldn't figure out how to distinguish between them. Um, ended up uh, uh, assembling large numbers of, of rural populations into essentially camps, fortified camps, uh, prison camps, in order to contain them. Um, so colonial, uh, the colonial powers in settler colonies brought in full military force and developed new kinds of military tactics in order to deal with, uh, with very creative um, uses of military force on the side of independence movements. So this is also a context in which liberation armies and independence movements developed terrorism tactics, guerrilla tactics, in which, they, in which they would blend in with the population and strike suddenly, uh, surprising the colonial powers, and, and leaving, again, without a trace. Um, assassinations were a, a key technique. Um, the army, the French army and other colonial armies um, responded by applying violence and torture on a large scale across an entire population. This, of course, had uh, a snowball effect in which Populations affected by this violence then began to join with the liberating, uh, with the liberation armies, uh, the independence armies, um, in opposition to the colonial powers, which they saw as more and more and more as abusive. So here you see um, some Kabyle women um, who have armed themselves to join in um, the Algerian Liberation Front. These violent struggles left a legacy in these countries of extreme political violence that continues today um, in places like Algeria, where there are regularly um, cases of extreme political violence. 
um, in uh, uh, Central Africa and in many other places where settler colonies resisted, uh, col colonizers resisted uh, independence movements with violence. So I want to sum up the basic characteristics of decolonization. We have two kinds of colony, non-settler colonies and settler colonies. Um, the, the, the index case, the key t case in this um, is India, but we also have the Philippines, um, West Africa, Um, in the case of settler colonies, these are places like Algeria, uh, uh, Kenya, Indochina, French Indochina, which then became Vietnam. Um, the characteristics of decolonization in these two places are very different. So in this case, we have negotiated independence. Um, and the use of the tools and the tactics of mass politics in order to mobilize people and to mobilize public opinion. So even though colonial forces may have been more powerful, they lost on the field of public opinion, of international public opinion. Um, and pressure then forced them to withdraw from the colony and to, al and to, and to allow uh, independence to occur. In settler colonies, on the other hand, um, we see um, by the use by insurgents, by independence movements of terrorist techniques um, and guerrilla tactics. So flexible uh, violence, uh, uh, very much tied in with populations, host populations. Um, and we see in response to that, European powers mobilize their military and develop counterinsurgency tactics. Um, and all of this left a legacy of extreme violence. So this is the, essen the essential map of two different kinds of colonies and the resulting differences in Decolonization. These then had an enormous impact on the sovereign states, the kinds of sovereign states, and the stability of those states, and the level of violence in those states that continues to this day.